Hi, my name is Mike Dillard, and this is Self Made Man, the podcast for those who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of your life. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. So there are only two real ways to change your life, and that's through the introduction of new information or new people, which means the more proactively you seek these out, the faster your life is going to change. Well, that's why groups like EO and Masterminds are so powerful for entrepreneurs. And one of the most valuable organizations that I've ever joined over my career is Tiger 21. So Tiger is a global mastermind group that focuses on helping entrepreneurs, ideally who've had an exit, responsibly invest their money, create a legacy, and make an impact on society. Now, there are currently 550 or so members around the world who control over $50 billion in investable assets. Now, in 2014, my former business partner, Robert, and I had the opportunity to become the founding members of the Austin Tiger 21 chapter. With the help of Texas chairman, Chris Ryan, the Austin chapter of Tiger has become one of the most valuable peer groups that I have ever been a part of for one primary reason. I was the least successful and youngest member of the group. So for the very first time in years, I was surrounded by people who inspired me and that I could really look up to and learn from. Well, the man that I have to thank for this experience joins us today, the founder of Tiger 21, Michael Sonnefeld. Michael's story is pretty amazing. At the age of 25, without any experience, he had a vision to transform the dilapidated Harborside Terminal in New Jersey and turn it into the state's new financial district. Well, a few years later, he'd find himself an incredibly rich young man, but with a new challenge many entrepreneurs will face, which is how to keep the money that you've made. Well, today, Michael is 62. He's gained a lifetime of knowledge and experiences, and he is here today to share those with you when it comes to building a business, making money, and creating a legacy. Please help me welcome Michael Sonnefeld. Well, Michael Sonnefeld, welcome to Self Made Man. It's a pleasure to finally have you on here. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. So I've already mentioned a little bit of this uh, in the intro, but you're the founder of Tiger 21, which is an organization that I'm a huge fan of. Uh, I was one of the two founding members of the Austin chapter three years ago, and it's been one of the best experiences that I've ever had uh, you know, in my life from a, a peer-to-peer learning perspective. So thank you so much for, for putting the time into building that for all of us. Thank you so much. It's, it's great to be there. You know, We impact on a lot of people's lives in positive ways, and I guess that's one of the great pleasures that I've had in uh, building the organization. You've had a pretty phenomenal story as uh, as an entrepreneur yourself you know getting getting to know you and and a little bit more about your career over the last few days has been really interesting and i wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about your story where you came from to give people some context about how you got to where you are today and i would love it if you could you know maybe start with uh, the harborside financial center deal that you did when you were what 25 26 years old well it started when i was 17 actually but I was able to actually acquire it when I was 25. The story is the following. Um, I was a kid who was slinging milk at the dairy store in my teens and uh, always doing all sorts of entrepreneurial things to make money. I was, uh, you know, raking leaves, shoveling snow, etc. And I also went off to college way too early. I went to the University of Michigan when I was 16 and promptly, uh, realized it was too early and I dropped out in 1972 and had to go to work. And so uh, I had a friend who had a father who was in the real estate business and he gave me a job at a warehouse. And that warehouse happened to be in Jersey City, which is directly across from Manhattan. And there was a pier at the end of the pier. I would meditate during the lunch hour and I'd look and see lower Manhattan in front of me across the water two, 3,000 feet away and abandoned rail yards behind me on the land uh, that I was attached to and had this idea to convert this building, which had been the largest building in the world when it was built in 1929. It was an industrial building, but I had the idea to turn it into a back office for computers for Wall Street that was uh, bursting at the seams at the time. And that started when I was 17, but it took about eight years 
for me to engineer a way to buy it with a partner. And even that was sort of a, a pretty lucky uh, turn of events. So we got to dive into the details of that. First and foremost, I got to I got to ask you, you're 17 years old. Who impressed upon you or taught you about meditation at that age? Well, in those days, there was a kind of a rage of transcendental meditation. And I've actually been a meditator on and off through my entire adult life. But really, there was a phase then where I went to transcendental meditation. You know, it was the early 70s. The 60s had just ended. Uh, the Beatles were in India meditating and people were experimenting with all sorts of things. And transcendental meditation became the rage. And I went to a course and tried it and was uh, a daily meditator for a year or two then. And then uh, actually just in recent years have picked it up in an even more serious way, but no longer transcendental meditation, which is just one form, just a basic form of Buddhist meditation every day for 45 minutes that allows me to uh, really connect to some of my most creative and personal thoughts. Wow, that's amazing. So, you know, what's most impressive to me about what you just shared is that you followed through on this idea and this vision you had for eight years, which is a, a huge commitment and a huge, uh, I guess, gosh, leap of faith, if you will. You're in your, in your early 20s. How did this all finally get executed? So what happened was uh, after I worked at the warehouse where I was meditating at the end of the pier, I realized it was time to go back to school. And uh, after working there about a year, I applied and got into MIT where I did my undergraduate and graduate work in the Sloan Business School. And so four years later, when I graduated, I got this amazing job on Wall Street at Goldman Sachs. But like other things, it wasn't for me. Part of the entrepreneurial journey is to know thyself and to learn when a situation plays to your strengths and when it plays to your weaknesses. And I think I was so overwhelmed by the chance to take this plum job on Wall Street that it didn't take a step back soon enough and say, is this really what I want to do? Is this what I'm cut out for? Is this what my personality is best suited for? And it became pretty quickly obvious that working at a large, even though it may have been the best investment bank, was not suited to my particular personality's weaknesses and strengths. And so after a few months in the merger department and a few more months in the real estate department, I went back to work for who had then become my father-in-law, that guy who had employed me six years or five years before in the warehouse. I had since got married to his daughter. And now I was working in the warehouse and slowly moving my way up when a couple senior people left and I found myself running this warehouse. And now I had the idea to really think about develop it, what it would mean to develop it. I, I hadn't developed anything. And it was, I guess, my good fortune in a funny way that my wife's family at the time were not developers. They were just owner operators. To develop properties takes an entire level of complexity. That's very different if you're just an owner operator and they didn't want that complexity in their business. And so I had to go find a partner to... Uh, entice to help me figure out how to wrest control of this facility. And it was just a stroke of luck. I, I constantly say luck favors those who are prepared and willing to take the risk. And I had somebody come in and his name was David Fromer. He, we were introduced to one another. Uh, he was 57. I was 24 at the time. And I showed this man who had developed real estate all over the world, had just moved back from London, had been a major residential developer of the go-go 60s in California in the uh, singles apartments with the swimming pool around the building. He, he'd really done it all. And I showed him this vision I had for what was going on. And he was as captivated by it as I was. And literally in a meeting, he said, let's do it. And as they say, the rest is history. So correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, uh, you know, a few years in, into the process, you're in your mid-20s, you're eventually able to sell the property for well over $100 million. And that was your first big exit. Is that accurate? Yes, absolutely. Except it came when I was, I think we closed when I was actually 31. 
Okay, awesome. So that opens up a whole different can of worms, right? At least, yeah. in, at least in my career, I can say that making money is actually uh, easier than keeping the money that you make uh, <laughs> and learning how to invest it. And so where, where did this eventually lead you to starting Tiger 21? Yeah, well, what you've just said is so prescient. It actually is my observation that having worked with now almost 900 entrepreneurs, m the vast majority of whom had a liquidity event, that in this time, literally now, where we have a low interest rate environment and such a complex geopolitical mix, for entrepreneurs, it's very often harder to manage the wealth they create after they sell the business than it was to make the wealth in the first place. And that's so counterintuitive, but we all have sweet spots. And if we're lucky enough to create a business in our sweet spot, it's like for those who remember records before CDs, you're in the groove and you know what you're doing. So here I was 31 and I'd sold this uh, project and really had no thoughts whatsoever about wealth preservation. I was thinking, boy, I'm 31. I just developed the world's largest commercial renovation. How hard could it be to do it again and again and again? And so you don't really know your limits. You know, success creates as many pitfalls as failure unless you learn from it. And most people who are very successful do not really understand what the specific nature is of their success. So they think they have much broader skills, but most people are successful in a very narrow band and they really don't know lots about other things. And that's what happened to me. I ventured far afield into an information business. It was about real estate, but you know, this was before the internet and a few other investments. And I assumed because I had been so successful the first time, if I made a few investments, at least one of them would be as equally successful. And that in retrospect is just really foolish. So I spent about five years on a number of other entrepreneurial ventures, none of them particularly successful. And it wasn't like I was stupid. I just wasn't as lucky as I had been the first time. And so I went back and finally started another real estate business and built that one up. I could talk about it, but the bottom line is it was very successful. And when I sold that business at 42, I said, I really have to be a little smarter this time than I was the first time uh, 11 years before. I want to figure out how to preserve wealth the way smart people do. And I looked around and I said, I'd like to find some other entrepreneurs who had sold their businesses and were really moving down this path of preserving capital after you sell. And that was the roots of Tiger, a group of people getting together to learn from one another. That's this world of peer-to-peer -peer learning, learning from one another so that they don't make mistakes that are foolish and to create a sort of personal board of directors that allowed them to learn from one another. And, and that's really what we've been doing for the last 20 years. So right now, there's just over 500 members globally in Tiger 21. And, uh, you know, combined, those individuals control about $50, million, $50 billion in assets making. It so possible. Mike, I hate to I hate to interrupt. But as of this morning, it's 561 members. And uh, it's a little over 55 billion. It's entrepreneurs meeting in 35 locations across North America, and now London, in 50 separate groups. Each group meets once a month for a full day in a facilitated meeting where Tiger 21 facilitators that are called chairs run each of those groups. And I know you know about it, but it's, it's, it's good to kind of focus on the, the process that we're doing. No, absolutely. And let's talk about that for a little bit. If you can, when you were coming up with the idea around Tiger and, and the essentially chapters, if you will, that you go through each day uh, within, uh, within the group's routine, if you will, or schedule. I'm sure they're all intentional and they're all there for a reason, but having a chance to talk to you as the founder is a pretty unique opportunity to get your perspective on the reason behind uh, uh, the magic, if you will. Sure. So I'd say the most transformative part of the day, uh, in a sense, is how we think about the segments. In a typical Tiger meeting, 
Some start at eight and go to four and some start at noon and go to seven. But typically we start out with what's called the world update and we go around the table, 12 people who are each uh, have come to the table. They've been vetted as members. They've signed confidentiality agreements. We've done background checks. We know that these are really first class people and that the accomplishments that they're claiming to have made have been validated so that we're not uh, we're trying to eliminate people who are frauds or uh, exaggerators and that really can help one another and the key to being around the table is that every person has something to learn a lifelong passion for learning but they also have something unique to teach because they enjoyed a certain level of unique success that the rest of the members can uh, t- can learn from And so the world update basically is everybody goes around and says, what happened in the last 30 days since we all met that most impacted my view either on the world or my portfolio or my outlook on life? And, you know, this is the one place where one person might say there was this horrible uh, terrorist bombing in uh, London and that's affected my investments in Europe and I'm doing this and that with it. Another person might say, my daughter is sick and frankly, uh, I'm so depressed that I haven't been thinking about investments. And what's so unique about this environment is the first person could have said that in an investment committee at any bank or uh, investment house, but normally the second person wouldn't be given the space to make a personal statement like that. But in the real life, that's just as powerful as the first. And so here's an environment where we mix the personal with the challenge of wealth preservation because it's so amazingly linked, particular, particularly after you've sold a business. So World Update takes an hour, hour and a half to get through 12 people, 15 people. And then through the World Update, we've identified particular issues. Somebody has an issue, a problem, an opportunity, and then we can really do a deep dive. And then comes what's the signature event and probably the most transformative, the portfolio defense. Mm -hmm. Every member once a year prepares their portfolio, their income statement, their balance sheet, and spends about a month or weeks, whatever it is, answering a 10 to 20 page questionnaire about the meaning of wealth, who is in their family that they have to support. If there were a major downturn, how would they position themselves? What are the lessons that they've learned that they can share with others? And it's really a deep dive, if you will. And it's the first time most people have an opportunity to defend their investment mandate if they've actually gotten to the point. So in today's environment, if somebody says, you know, I don't really want to have any risk in my portfolio. I want to kind of keep it simple. And all I want to do is earn 15% a year. You don't have to look at the numbers to start the discussion because in this environment, you can't have a risk-free approach that generates 15%. If you're generating 15%, it almost 100% is sure that you have risks that you don't know about or that maybe you do know about. So philosophy or investment thesis is where it all starts. But once you say, let's say more particularly, my belief is I can generate a three or 4% return. Now you can look at the numbers and say, how are you doing against that benchmark? How is your portfolio diversified? And all of the parameters that 12 smart people might think about. And it's different for every person because I might be over, I might be carrying too little cash so I can't protect myself in a downturn. And you might have too much invested in biotechnology because you have this great passion. And the group will say, um, you know, you're over-invested. That's just not prudent if you want to take a long term. But the way you might prove it to us is what is the returns you've enjoyed over a long period of time? If you're one in a million or one in a hundred thousand and you've gotten extraordinary returns, then maybe that overweight is justified, but there are some limits. I'll just end with a story of 15 years ago or so, I guess a little more than 10 years ago, a member did a portfolio defense and said, you know, I have 75% of my 
assets and the most fantastic fund. Nobody had heard of it. Uh, his name is Bernie Madoff. <laughs> no. and, uh, but the group said, you know, we don't know who this guy Madoff is, but it doesn't matter who he is or what his return is. You can have a long-term wealth preservation in a, an appropriate way if you're overly concentrated. You shouldn't have more than 10 or 20 percent and probably closer to 10 percent, but between 10 and 20 percent in any one investment because there's risks that you just don't know about. And that member said, uh, you know, basically, uh, I'm not going to stay in this group anymore because we just have such different philosophies. This has been such a great investment for me. I'd be a fool to give it up because it's generating so much income. And obviously, the rest is history. But it was just such an amazing example that no matter how great an investment is, when you're an investor, if you don't prudently diversify, things like that can happen. It's only a risk. But if it happens, boy, watch out. That's amazing. Again, I've been a part of EO and and Tiger over the years, and it was such an awesome experience for me personally, because uh, for the most part, I was the youngest guy in the room in our group. And so being surrounded by a group of individuals who are older than me, wiser than me, more experienced, you know, to learn from was a really rare opportunity that was unbelievably valuable. So it's been, uh, it's been awesome. One last Mike, question. Mike, I think you know, most of our members were always the youngest guy or gal in the room until they weren't, until they uh, stopped being that. And my whole life, I was the youngest guy in the room until about 10 or 15 years ago when I started being the oldest guy in the room. <laughs> right, you know, exactly. It, it, hap- it happens to the best of us. It's, uh, I turned 40 a week ago, two weeks ago. So <laughs> it's, been a, it's been a wake up call. I'm an officially an adult now. Yeah. There's no arguing that. So one last question about Tiger, and then I want to move on to your book. But who is Tiger for if they are interested in learning more about this? Tiger is the premier network peer-to-peer learning for high net worth, first generation wealth creators, generally entrepreneurs, primarily at that moment when they've thought about or actually have executed a sale that results in a liquidity event. And in that moment, that's what we've been studying for 20 years. In that moment, an entrepreneur has to become at least in part an investor or wealth preserver. And it turns out that those are, as our member David uh, Russell from Miami says, those are antithetical. It turns out if you're a great entrepreneur, you're probably going to be a mediocre investor because the skills that it took you To be a great entrepreneur, concentrating everything on one opportunity, constantly making things happen, reacting, changing, doing, hiring, firing, all of these things that have kept you alive and so successful, as a great investor, they're all the opposite. You have to diversify, not focus. You have to set the course of your portfolio and watch it, not react to it every day. Sometimes the best investors make one or two or three investments a year, and the average investment lasts for three, four, five years, and they just watch it. So there's a kind of passivity, not that it's not work or hard work, it's just a completely different rhythm. And for most entrepreneurs, when they become wealth preservers and investors, it's kind of like watching the paint dry. They really have to completely relearn something that from a distance seems so common in entrepreneurs and investors. But Tiger is really focused on people who want to hone their wealth preservation skills and also want to be part of a community because when you can surround yourself with peers you have a magic of learning from one another. So some people are focused on the financial aspects and others are focused on the community aspects. And the last uh, motivation has to do with legacy. This, this is a place where our members can explore, A, what they're doing with their children and how are they handling their children, and B, what kind of legacy do they want to leave? Very much thinking about this transition when you sell a business from success to significance. What, what's the meaning of my life? What do I want to do? And this is a setting that's very intimate, very confidential, and allows really successful people to uh, explore these issues with others who have gone down this path before them and who are on the path with them at the same time. So 
from a legacy perspective, you've checked a big box off this year, you know, when it comes to yours and, and how you can contribute everything that you've learned uh, with your, your new book, Think Bigger. And so what drove you to take the time and put in the effort to write this book and what's it about? So the basic premise of the book is that really great entrepreneurs to a large extent are a different species than the rest of the folks who inhabit the business world. And what I mean by that is great entrepreneurs exhibit personality traits, intellectual traits that are distinguishable, not every person because there's lots of examples, but great entrepreneurs have the ability to delay gratification, to pick themselves up in the face of adversity, to keep going. That's a a measure of grit, if you will. They've learned how to get great mentors to help them figure things out in terms of their career anchors or their personalities. They have a high need for for being independent as opposed to people who are equally successful in a corporate environment have uh, higher needs for security than independence. And so there's a number of traits that we've studied and academics have studied. One of the ones that's most interesting that's required of any leader of an organization is these three forms of focus, inner focus, other focus and outer focus. Inner is know thyself and other focus is look around at your team and the people you work with. Are you sensitive to what their issues are? And this outer focus of, you know, what's the competition? And unless you can do all three of those simultaneously, it's very difficult to be a successful entrepreneurial leader. So really what the book is about is uh, what makes entrepreneurs tick. And it's not a simple how to get rich book. There's thousands of those and uh, some have great insight. This is really reflections from the high mountain of success of 25 very different entrepreneurs who've looked back over their career and said, what are the lessons learned over the arc of my career at the beginning, the middle, and uh, when I decided to sell and even after I sold it? And that's really what the book is. Would you be willing if we dove in on a a couple of specific topics in general? Sure. Absolutely. Love to. I'm just going to kind of pick some that interest me most that I think uh, a lot of folks would be would like to hear about. You know, one of them that's that sticks out to me, lesson 23, think twice before investing with friends and family. Yeah. So, you know, when you're a first time entrepreneur, you do whatever you have to do to get a business up and running. You raise capital from wherever you can raise it. But what we've noticed is that serial entrepreneurs, when they reach a level of success, very often uh, friends and family almost want to throw money at them. They, they see that this person has been amazingly successful, and the easy route to the second or third business is to start it with money from friends and family. And I think this is a real difficult pitfall uh, for two reasons. One is... As I mentioned before, when you've had a success for your first business, you are totally miscalculating the likelihood of success for your second. And if you take friends and family money in your second business and it doesn't work, not only are they going to be disappointed that the money didn't make money, but worse, they're going to say, I couldn't, how could you lose money? You you were such a success and you didn't even realize that you were painting yourself as a success and people were maybe deceiving themselves and maybe you were deceiving and you can lose a lot of relationships when friends and family don't do well. What the other part of it is, is there's a common mistake that people want to get as high a valuation for a business as possible. And I call that a rookie mistake because it's much more important to get the right investors, to get strategic partners. And who's going to give you the highest valuation? Friends and family. Why? Because they're not professionals. They can't assess the risks of your business. So you go out to an institution and they'll say, I'll give you a $5 million valuation. And if we put in a million dollars, you know, we'll want one sixth of the business. And the friend, and you go to friends and they'll give you a $10 million valuation. So you're much more likely to want to go to friends and family. But they're making a rookie mistake or you're making a rookie mistake because they think of success as binary. 
you're either going to lose all my money, in which case it didn't uh, matter what the price was, or we're going to make a fortune. And they have no real way to understand precisely how to measure the risk. A professional investor might only give you a lower valuation, but they might help you in ways that friends and family can't. They can open doors. They can uh, bring opportunities to you. They have a network of potential uh, employees. They've done this before, so they know how to structure a business or a marketplace or so forth. So I simply caution people that while you clearly understand that you have to do whatever you have to do to get a business off the ground the first time, the drug, the elixir of being able to tap into friends and family capital is a kind of a fool's paradise because it often allows them to invest at too high a rate. And uh, if you fail, the personal and emotional toll is just way too high. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely agreed with that one. Uh, I've always been avoidant of raising money of any kind from anybody <laughs> just because I don't, right. want, I don't want that pressure. Lesson 35, don't give your kids anything, but be willing to invest everything in them. Yeah, this is my favorite chapter in the book. We had a prospective member come to join Tiger once, and he was joining because he was about to make a fortune, a, a real fortune on an investment he made. And I said to him, you know, I'm curious, uh, uh, in your planning, did you ever think of having your kids own a part of that investment? So that if it was successful, the part that they earned, as opposed to you, would not be part of your estate and you'd avoid the estate tax on that. Many successful entrepreneurs in later deals include their children directly so the profits don't pass through the estate. They are earned directly by the children. And this guy said, no, I'm, I'm not giving my kids anything. And sort of alarm bells went off in me because I'm thinking, here's another tough love story. One of, one of the things that happens with first-time entrepreneurs is, by definition, if, if they're first-time entrepreneurs, it probably means they grew up in some kind of challenged uh, circumstance, lower middle class, working class, where whatever the challenges were, they wanted to prove to the world that they could do better than that. There's nothing wrong with growing up in any part of the world or any part of America. But when you have these ambitious kids, you know, they, they had it tough. They really had it tough. So many entrepreneurs had it tough and, and now they want to reproduce for their children that same tough environment, except they forget for the first 20 years of their kid's life, the parents might already have been successful. So the kids didn't grow up in those tough surroundings, and now it's like pulling the carpet out hmm. from underneath them just when they're graduating college or something and saying, okay, now you, you're you going to tough it out just like I did. And it, it's it's a false it's a false paradise. The, the second generation grew up in a completely different world, and there's other ways to motivate them. So I'm thinking this is another tough love story. This is guy is saying, he says, no, 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 you don't understand. I don't want to give my kids anything but I'm prepared to invest everything in them. And this was like a wow moment because all of a sudden it changed the dynamic. So many parents are afraid of giving too much to their children because they'll waste it or they'll be incentivized to do nothing or it'll be supporting a lifestyle that the parents don't believe in. And yet they want to give kids these opportunities. And this notion of investing in your children means when you give your kids money, make it an investment, hold, hold them to the standard of a return, not just a financial return. Maybe it's an intellectual return or a social return or a human return. Those financial, intellectual, social, and human create the acronym that one of our members in uh, Montreal talks about, FISH, F-I-S-H. And if you can say, if I'm investing in you, you either have to go to college or go to graduate school or you have to be a better philanthropist or a better member of your uh, community. You know, there's lots of different ways to do it. But the point is that when you give your kids the money, don't just make it a gift, imply an investment and hold them to a standard of thinking about this money as helping them to get a return on it and make a better life. Yeah, that's something uh, 
I've been thinking about a lot recently as well. I have a seven-year-old and I've been in, in the middle of redoing my, my living trust and all of that stuff. And it's hard. Like it's, yeah. it's really hard because there is no, there is no right answer. You describe my background perfectly, which is why I had the drive to become an entrepreneur. He's growing up in a really different environment. And so where's that drive going to come from? You know, right. Yeah. So really interesting challenge to have to deal with, but that's why. That's why it's so awesome to be able to, to learn from people who've come from you and already gone through that. Right. So I want to talk real quick about diversification because I've heard a lot of different pieces of conflicting advice. Mm -hmm. There's a very good portion of members of our group here in Austin who have their specialty. It's, what, it's what's built their wealth. It's what their business is focused on. It's what they know best. Let's take real estate, for example. And so the vast majority of their assets are invested in real estate. And I've heard from other individuals who are very successful that that's it. Focus on what you know and don't worry about diversification. And then you hear the opposite and where it's like diversification is extremely important. <laughs> you know, so yeah. uh, what, what, is your, what is your lessons learned for us on that? Where you stand depends on where you sit. And where I, what I mean is that First of all, there are some basic rules about diversification. The, f the first is to, uh, to avoid diversification. And diversification is when you have so many investments that no one of them will move the needle and it's just all over the place. So you, you don't keep the, the question is what is prudent diversity? The second is diversification to somebody who, let's say, inherited money or an executive who's running a business and gives his or her money to a money manager and says, you know, give me a prudent portfolio is very different than most entrepreneurs who become investors because most entrepreneurs have an edge. They've succeeded at something. And when you get to the level of success to be a Tiger 21 member, you're about one in 10,000. That just gives you an idea of your relative success. And so you have a skill. It might be that you're the best paperclip manufacturer in the world. It might be that you're the best football maker in the world. Uh, whatever it is, you're doing something unique and uniquely well. And to not use those skills in your investments is depriving you of what you spent 20 and 30 years honing. Now, obviously, when you become an investor, you do need diversification. So if I were a real estate developer in New York and I decided to retire or sell that business, maybe I'm not investing just in real estate in New York, but I'm looking at REITs across the country and industrial real estate in California and different things in Detroit and uh, Houston or Dallas or whatever. My point is you still want to have diversification. The other thing that you have to uh, talk about is safety. So diversification doesn't mean that even if you have an edge, you put all of your money in things you know about. You still have to have a certain amount of cash that's prudent. And Tiger members typically hold about 12% of their portfolios in cash. Uh, and that's enough cash that if there's a major market downturn, you can weather the storm for three, four, five years. It's also enough cash that if there's an opportunity, you might be able to pounce on it. So I think the, the notion is diversification is really important, but there's an equally important topic called risk. I don't know if we have time to talk about it, but the two are sort of flip sides of the same coin. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So the most important thing is that in certain areas of the economy or walks of life, you can quantify risk mathematically. If you're flipping a coin, you know how to quantify risk. And in securities analysis, the commonly accepted way of quantifying risk is to look at the past volatility, the ups and downs of a stock. And the more a stock goes up and down, the more it is volatile and how big the ups and downs are makes it more volatile. And it's said that the risk of a stock is the volatility. Well, that's like driving a car through the rear view mirror. In other words, with securities analysis, there's some reason to believe that you can look through the rear view mirror of prices to get a sense of the risk of a stock. But obviously, 
it counts for nothing right before a stock market crash because the past volatility didn't uh, predict it. My point is that risk to a very large degree is in the eyes of the beholder, but only to the extent that people have unique abilities to see the risk. So if you're a uh, radio announcer and I'm a real estate developer and we're walking down the street and we're in a mediocre part of town and there's an empty, dilapidated building, and I'm going to say, what do you think that building worth? You might say, ah, it's probably not worth anything. Who could do anything with it? I wouldn't know what to do with it. Well, if I'm a real estate developer, I might say, oh, I love that building. If I buy it cheap enough, I can fix it up really nicely and create an incubator for new businesses and rent it out cheap enough to help a whole bunch of businesses get up and running. So in that case, the risks we were looking at were in the eye of the beholder. And somewhere between risks being in the eye of the beholder, those people who have an edge to analyze the risk, and it being just statistical like the flip of a coin, is where risk lies. And thinking about risks through that that lens of where along that axis does the risk lie? Is it just flip of a coin risk that's sort of statistical? Or is it judgment risk where specialized knowledge can give you an advantage, gives entrepreneurs particularly a huge leg up when they're thinking about investing the proceeds of the sale? They want to prudently diversify. They don't want to put all their eggs in one basket, but they want to take advantage of the skills and knowledge they've built over the years. Yeah, absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. So I've got one final question to end on for you here, which is to really sum up, you know, the vision behind the book and the purpose, which is Lesson 22, Think Bigger. So one of our chairs, those are the facilitators who run our group from Washington. Cal Simmons is a fantastic serial entrepreneur himself. But in his group, he has some entrepreneurs that are just at a completely different scale, have created not businesses with tens of employees or hundreds of employees, but thousands of employees and businesses that operate not in one or two or five location, but thousands of locations. And his observation was when you look at the really great entrepreneurs, the thing that he saw over and over and over again was that the really great entrepreneurs just think bigger. They take a problem and like, Bill Gates said everyone should have a computer on their desk. And like Google said, everyone should be able to access the internet everywhere. And Facebook says everybody should be able to talk to everybody. These are like billion customer visions in Facebook, two billion customer visions. And we don't, I don't deal so much in the mega successes of the billionaires, but at the next level down, You're still talking about amazing successes where people have created tens and hundreds of millions of dollars of value. And they've done it because unlike one guy who starts a travel agency as one travel agency, this was Cal Simmons story. And a friend came in when he opened it and said, where are you going to open your next travel agency? Cal said, what are you talking about? I never thought about that. I'm just, I'm just doing my first, this was all I had thought about. But after he thought about it, He opened a second, and then he opened a third, and eventually opened 10. But even in those days, 10 was great, and he sold that. But it's not a 1,000 or a 100 or whatever the number is. So the bottom line is that one of the traits of success, really successful entrepreneurs is they've just been able to push the vision to reach a little further than their grasp and to keep moving so that when one goal is about to be reached, They're already formulating and reaching for the next one. And uh, most entrepreneurs would push them, would do well to push themselves a little further and create a little bigger vision. And if they do, by thinking bigger, they're going to really propel their career in a really positive way. Yeah, agreed. You know, the way I've thought about this and have tried to communicate it to others is that you're going to be putting in the exact same amount of effort and work to either idea. (laughs) So even if you're running, you know, one small, let's say, restaurant shop, you're probably going to be working there 10 to 12 hours a day. Rather than working on a vision to franchise that into a thousand shops, you're still going to work 10 to 12 hours a day. But the outcome between the two is dramatically different. Mike, my, uh, my partner used to say, 
working on a hard on a big deal is just as hard as working on a small deal but if you're successful you'll be a lot happier exactly exactly it's it's uh, something most folks need to be really conscious about because that's it it's the difference between you know lifelong wealth and and having to to keep grinding away well michael this has been this has been awesome it's been unbelievably educational i've loved hearing your story we've only gone over 4 out of the you know 40 lessons here in the book I love the fact that you've been able to condense this into something that you can read in a day or two, which I'm a big fan of. I don't like books that are 400 pages long. So this has been a real treat. So thank you so much for taking the time today to join us. For me too. Thanks very much. And by the way, the book is available on Amazon.com. It's Think Bigger and 39 Other Winning Strategies from Successful Entrepreneurs. Absolutely. And guys, if a few of you out there qualify for Tiger 21, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, go to tiger21.com and, uh, and check it out and uh, use the contact form to learn more. It's been one of the single best and fulfilling investments that I've ever made uh, in myself as, a, as an entrepreneur. So Michael, thanks again. This was, uh, this was awesome. Uh, I really do appreciate it. And thanks for all that you've contributed to my life and our fellow entrepreneurs in Tiger. Thank you. It's a pleasure to do so. Absolutely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thanks as always. We'll see you next week. Take care.